gentle disclaimer to all of our listeners. All medical information mentioned in this podcast is purely informational. It is not individualized medical advice. Please follow up with your physician or medical practitioner for individualized care specific to your needs. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Know and Do Better podcast. My name is Dr. Melanie Carminati, and I am excited to have Dr. Michael Werner here with us. Dr. Werner, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So we will be speaking today about Sex After 70, Men's Health Edition. I want to first introduce Dr. Werner for those who are not familiar with him. Dr. Michael A. Werner is a board-certified urologist who received his specialized fellowship training in male infertility and surgery and male sexual dysfunction at Boston University Medical Center. His private practice in Midtown Manhattan and Westchester, New York, are limited to his two areas of specialization, that being male infertility and male and female sexual dysfunction. He lectures and writes extensively on these topics in medical journals and books. So Dr. Werner, thank you again. I am very happy to have you on because our first podcast episode, Sex After 70, focused primarily on female sexual health concerns. We had Dr. Dina Harris on, who's a gynecologist. From that podcast, there were many, many comments in the podcast asking specifically What about men's health? What can we do, men who are over 70, for sex and intimacy? So I wanted to have you open up, having you share your clinical experience with male patients 70 and over, and what has that been like in regards to sex and intimacy, and what are some of the common complaints patients come in with? Right. So obviously, men and women are living dramatically longer than we used to. When men died at an average of 35 or 40, then they usually died before their penis stopped working. We didn't really have much erection issues and we didn't have really any treatments. It wasn't much of discussion. So as we're living longer, we are getting into more and more men having sexual issues. The two main issues that are age-related, getting and maintaining an erection or erectile dysfunction, and interestingly, difficulty with ejaculation. So as men get older, it takes more and more stimulation in order to reach a climax. The first thing that we addressed in sexual medicine, I can't take personal credit, was the erectile dysfunction. And we've been treating that for a very long time. The first modality that came about was the penile implant or prosthesis. Next came what are the penile injections, which we still use for men. And then The third uh, tranche that came, I mean, there's many little ones in between, was the revolution was in 1998, actually on my anniversary, when they they released Viagra. So I've been in practice since 1994, and at that point, that was pre-internet and pre-Viagra. The men had really no idea that anyone else was suffering from erectile dysfunction. So it was, you know, very eye-opening. In fact, I used to have to advertise in a phone book because that was the only way people could actually find out that other people (laughs) had this issue. But think did open up in 1998. So my mantra has always been, you know, if you have a penis, we can get you an erection. And that is true. You always start with the least invasive modalities. So we have oral medications. We have something called shockwave therapy, which we'll talk about. We have the penile injections, which I love, and we have the implant. What's happened now is since we can get everyone an erection and men are living longer and longer, we are now getting more and more men who are having difficulty, even though they get and maintain a good erection. They're having interest course, and they're having a hard time reaching a climax from sexual intimacy. And so that is a more difficult problem, and that's one that's disproportionately affecting men in their 70s. So can we talk about pelvic pain and how you go about treatment of that and the connection to that with erectile dysfunction? Yeah. So interestingly, I'm sort of becoming an expert or have become an expert on what we call, which you're familiar with, the pelvic floor therapists are, but most urologists are not, unfortunately, what we sort of refer to as chronic pelvic pain syndrome. Mm -hmm. The way I sort of explain it to my patients is there's a lot of different ways that you can hold your tension. So some people get migraines, some people get irritable bowel, some people get backache, but a lot of people, and now we're talking about men, hold their tension in their pelvis. And that can manifest in basically affecting the organs that go through the the pelvis, which are, of course, your prostate, your bladder, and your colon, your, your rectum. So we find that there's four classes of 
symptoms that men will present with. So they can come in with atypical pain. So it can be in the perineum, it can be the tip of the penis, it can be the penis, it can be the testes, inner thighs. They come in with urination issues, frequency, mm -hmm. urgency, nocturia, dysuria. They yeah. come in with erection and ejaculation issues, and they come in with bowel issues. And it really is, I, I swear I'm going to write a 200-page book with all of the different symptoms that men can have, because everyone assumes that they're unique, and they seem to cherry pick different symptoms. So no one really presents exactly the same. But when you get those symptoms and some configuration of them, you know that's exactly what you're dealing with. I had this when I was in my 30s, when I was under a lot of stress during residency, mm -hmm. and it really wasn't recognized as a syndrome, and, and the causality was not recognized. And most men are put on multiple doses of Cipro or something for classic chronic prostatitis, which really is chronic pelvic pain until proven otherwise. The interesting thing is that the antibiotic have an anti-inflammatory effect. So actually the men will feel better for a while and then feel worse when they come off of them. And then everyone's convinced that it was an infection and they just need to keep treating them. So they go on to long courses of antibiotics. But I've had people who've had spinal surgeries and nerve surgeries, unbelievable amounts of workup. And they almost all have a cystoscopy when you look in the bladder with a scope, which of course is invasive in, in a young or older person. It's a diagnosis that we get from the history. Through my reading, we've actually come up with nothing as foolproof, but a crazily successful way of treating this, which is really a stool with three legs, which involves, of course, pelvic floor therapy. So pelvic floor therapy is super important. We also put them on daily Tadalafil or Cialis, which relaxes smooth muscle. We don't know exactly how it helps, but we know it helps with voiding and it does relax the pelvic muscles. Then it's a harder pill, literally, for the men to swallow. They all need to be on something for anxiety. Not a benzodiazepine, because those are addictive, but mm -hmm. something, uh, SSRI, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor, SNRI, something that you would treat that's not addictive, but that's long-term for anxiety. And I find when they do only two of these three, they don't get better at the same rate as when they do all three. So we spend a lot of time convincing them to go to pelvic floor therapy. Many men, particularly straight men, don't like anything going up their bottom, including a pelvic floor therapist's finger, but it needs to go there. And the daily Cialis is unbelievably cheap now. There's a new pharmacy that Mark Cuban started called Cost Plus Drugs, and 90 of them are about $20. So it used to be hundreds of dollars. And that's a good thing to know for your patients also. For almost all the generics, I don't know if you use them, they're shockingly cheap because generics are shockingly cheap and the markup is happening at the retail pharmacies, which drives me moderately insane. And also most of the anti-anxiety medicines are generic at this point too. That combination works very well. It takes a long time, but it works very well for chronic pelvic pain. So as a pelvic floor physical therapist, I can say that we do for male pelvic patients that are coming in or coming for pelvic floor physical therapy, pelvic pain is the number one thing that they're coming in for. And they present with that array of symptomology that you mentioned. One of the things that I briefly mentioned to you before we recorded this was the win back to car therapy. And that's a form of radio frequency that has been really helpful for all of our pelvic patients, all of our orthopedic patients, but especially the male pelvic pain patients, because it allows us to get deeper into the tissue because the radio frequency, what we do is we have a bracelet on our forearm and the current is transmitted through our hands and then transmitted into the patient because for men, we have to do the rectal internal manual therapy and sometimes getting to some specific trigger points and muscles can be challenging. The radio frequency helps to facilitate that much more and it gives longer lasting results. And as many men know who have been to pelvic floor physical therapy, it's not always the most comfortable treatment, but with the wind back to car therapy, because it gives a warming sensation, the radio frequency just feels like a warmth. It's actually more enjoyable and in for the patients and they end up requesting it. That's great. Is that standard then? Is that your first line therapy for like pelvic floor dysfunction? So we don't typically do it on the first session, building that rapport. And we typically will do standard internal manual therapy rectally for the male patients first. And then we will introduce it in a follow-up session. Unless we do have patients sometimes who have already been through pelvic floor physical therapy and they come to us specifically because we also have this modality. It's really wonderful. And so I wanted to come back to everything that you just explained in regards to that trifold or the three-tiered treatment that you're using for the pelvic pain patients. If the pelvic pain is the driver of the erectile dysfunction, 
that will help with the erectile dysfunction? How else, what other treatments and what other factors come into play for treating erectile dysfunction? So with erectile dysfunction, basically, in order to get an erection, a man has to both get the blood into the penis and hold on to it. The etiologies for erectile dysfunction can be vascular, neurologic, hormonal, or psychogenic. So we sort of try to figure out what's going on. And then in terms of treatment, there is something that's relatively new. It sounds almost a little bit like your therapy. It's called low-intensity shockwave therapy, which sounds like it's a shock going into your penis, so it's it's a wrong name, but basically it's a pressure wave. There's something called high-intensity shockwave lithotripsy, which is when they basically break up a kidney stone from the outside outside and you send basically pressure waves through the tissue that focus in on the stone and can break it up. So that's high intensity shockwave therapy. There's low intensity, which is basically sending a pressure wave into the penis. They're not sure exactly why it makes the blood flow better. Different theories is that it maybe reduces the debris inside the vessels or maybe start the blood vessels regenerating. But we've had very good luck with that treatment, which is totally non-invasive, improving the quality of the men's erection. That's that's sort of nice. It only really works if their problem is getting the blood into the piece. If they have a massive leak out, it's not going to work because it's really affecting the inflow and they won't be able to compensate. So that's very nice for the men who really want to improve their sexual functioning. And if they don't have a big leakage, that can be very successful. We love the oral medications and a lot of men, they work really well. In general, I start men at the maximum dose of the medications and pull down if they're doing great because there's always a psychological component and once you're having problems then the more times you have problems the harder it is to break that psychological piece so i want to get in there get them good erections get them confident again and then they can sort of pull down on the dosage uh, one of the problems with the pills are that they're often used incorrectly so it's important to know that Viagra, sildenafil, peaks at an hour after you take it and has to be taken on an empty stomach, and then half of it's gone at four hours. Most men love the Cialis, which is Tadalafil as a generic. It takes three or four hours to kick in, so it's great if you're anticipating sex that evening. But the nice thing is you can take it with food, and it stays in your system for a long time. So half of it's gone. It takes 18 hours for half of it to be gone. So if you take it in the evening, you, you might wake up in the morning with a very good erection and be ready to go. Those two are both generic and very cheap. Uh, people are spending a lot of money because they don't want to go in to see their doctor. It's probably almost 100 times more expensive milligram per milligram when they get it there than if they get it from a prescription from their doctor and get it on cost plus, where 20 of the 90, you know, the 20 milligrams of the Cialis are about $14, $15, 20 something. So it's important with the pills to use them correctly. If the pills are not working, then I really, really do love the penile injections, the intracavernosal penile injections, which sound horrible. And every man says it, I'm not in a million years would I put a needle in my penis, but it's a 30 gauge needle and you put it in an auto injector and you press the button and they literally, either they don't feel it or mostly they feel like they've been flicked with a rubber band. And again, like any other treatment, you're, if you can get your medication directly where you need it, then you have more success. With an eye infection, eye drops are better than oral antibiotics. For lung issues, you would love to use something you can inhale rather than taking it orally. The advantages of the injections are that they are much, much, much more powerful than the pills, and they don't give you any systemic side effects, and they can help rehab the penis. So it takes a little finesse to know how to do them and to teach people how to do them and figure out the right dosage. But if the pills are not working, the injections work beautifully. If those are not working, there's you know, there's other kinds of things like there's a vacuum erection device, there's constriction bands, but really if they have a major leakage, then they should go into a penile prosthesis or an implant, which is all internal. They don't walk around looking like some kind of freak. It's basically a closed system. There's a little ball in, in the scrotum and you basically compress it and it pushes the fluid from a reservoir into the chambers that are sitting in the penis and the man gets good erection. And when he's finished, he presses another button in the scrotum and it goes down. Sensation is the same. It's just mechanically giving oh, the men no. erection. So that's why we can get any man a good erection. 
I wanted to have you explain the difference because my understanding for younger male patients who have premature ejaculation, there is a large component of anxiety with that. Can you explain the difference between that and then the ejaculation difficulties in older males? So premature ejaculation is the most common sexual function, dysfunction, and we really divide it not by age as much as by whether the men have it lifelong or whether it's acquired. Most of the time, it is not psychological. And it's just, it's almost like a reflex. And some people have reflexes that are faster and some people have reflexes that are slower. We have some men that are so extreme that they actually have never been able to get into an orifice. They call it pre portal, I love that name, ejaculation. Basically, if someone touches them or showers them or whatever, they ejaculate. Most men couldn't do that even if they wanted to. So that is not psychological. That's very physical. And some men just ejaculate with very little stimulation. We used to think that that would respond well to behavioral therapy, and that sort of dropped off. The longer I've been doing this, the longer I realize that it is not psychological. So that's lifelong. And the best treatment for that, in my mind, there are topics things to make to numb the penis a little bit and you're trying not to get it on the vagina or the anus you can wash it off and it still numbs the area without being transmissible but the best treatment for that are the ssris the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors not because the men are depressed though it's not fun to have premature ejaculation but one of the side effects from some of the ssris are to delay ejaculation in fact the meds for anxiety and depression, that's their main side effect, which we're using for an advantage for the men with premature ejaculation. Obviously, for men or women who already have difficulty reaching a climax, that can make it worse. So whenever I'm prescribing one of these medicines for patients, my first question is for the men, in general, how is your ejaculatory control? If they have premature ejaculation, I'll use one of the three, Prozac, which is fluoxetine, Paxil, which is paroxetine, or Zoloft, uh, which is sertraline. And those three are known to have the most effect in delaying ejaculation. If men are anxious and depressed and already having difficulty reaching a climax, then I'll have a tendency to use a relatively new drug, which doesn't fit in neatly into a class, which just became generic. So it was called Vibrid, and now the generic is Velazodone. Whenever I'm trying to prescribe a medication, my first first question is, what is their ejaculatory control like? But we specifically will target uh, those medicines for men, even if they don't have any mood or anxiety disorders, for the treatment of premature ejaculation. And it's pretty successful. We can always manage premature ejaculation. Can you tell me cases or situations where you would refer for psychotherapy or sex therapy as well? I refer a lot of patients for psychotherapy and for sex therapy. People have very complicated histories, a lot of them. I'm always impressed with my patients, many of whom come from, and they can be middle class, upper middle class, who really come from very complicated backgrounds with abuse scattered through there and and some terrible experiences. And I always think they're sort of walking miracles. But obviously, if they've had horrible sexual experiences, then it's going to affect them. And that needs to be addressed in therapy. I can get almost anyone an erection, but that doesn't mean that they can have a great relationship or be, in, you know, really be vulnerable and intimate. As part of my team, every patient uh, who comes in with any kind of sexual dysfunction is seen by our sex therapist, sex advisor to get a full history. And that really uh, does inform our treatment quite a bit. Can we talk about um, patients with low libido and treatments for that? In general, as men get older, our testosterones get lower, and that's true of women as well. We, we put a lot of women on testosterone, but obviously lower doses. Libido can be quite complicated. Obviously, if you are not getting along with your sexual partner or not finding them attractive, which is usually because you're not getting along, honestly, uh, then that's going to make you want to have less intimacy. But as people get older, their testosterones get lower, and that has a profound effect on libido. To me, it's very odd that a particular hormone makes you, to be crude, want to put a penis in a vagina or an anus, but it's <laughs> shocking that that's what happens. you know. And when we give men who have low libidos and are otherwise not that complicated in terms of their relationships and what they're interested in, you see dramatic improvement in their libido. You give uh, men uh, testosterone, they are dramatically more interested in sex. So it, a lot of my patients are obviously heterosexual. And one of the truisms is that 
in general, men have higher testosterone levels than women, and most men have a higher libido. If it's a bell curve, you have a curve, you know, and then an intersecting bell curve with men having higher libido than women on average. And what we do find is that in a marriage, a man's or relationship, a man's libido drops off dramatically, and his female partner's is much higher than his. This is very disturbing for both of them. Women have a tendency, not to generalize, to take it quite personally and feel like, oh, he's not attracted to me. He's having an affair. I'm getting older. You know, it's yeah. a it's a very, it's very threatening to them. Uh, they take it sort of onto themselves. And it's, it's a bad dynamic for a relationship. It's always a bad dynamic if there's a fairly sizable difference in libidos, but it's particularly bad for the relationship when a woman has a dramatically higher libido than her male partner. It's really important that that people have intimacy in their relationship. I find usually relationships fall apart if the intimacy leaves and men do need to have good levels of testosterone usually to have a libido or the converse is even more true. If they have a low libido, the vast majority of them will have a dramatic improvement in their libido with the testosterone. Amazing. And I understand in your practice, I know this podcast is focused on men's health, but you also are treating women's sexual dysfunction as well at Maze. Yeah, we have a women's center. We've had it for more than 20 years. We do have women seeing the women. One of the things that we treat are low libido issues. Sometimes it's as simple as they're on the wrong medication. You know, if you put them on a medication that decreases libido, it's going to decrease their libido. You know, usually the psychotropic medications, the antidepressants. But as they get older, then their hormones drop, both their their estrogen and their testosterone, both of which are needed for libido. So I'm a great advocate for hormone replacement therapy, which is still controversial, though I think 20 years from now, we're going to look back and think this is an idiotic conversation because the data, I think, so women being on bioidentical estrogen, progesterone, and probably, you know, some testosterone as well. That's that's a whole different story, but it drives me literally insane. My wife never went through menopause. When she had her knee replaced earlier this year, the orthopedist said that he's never seen such good bone density in a woman who was 64. To me, since most women end up in trouble with trouble with broken bones as opposed to breast cancer, the theoretical possible increased chance of breast cancer from estrogen, even though it doesn't even affect longevity, seems to me way worth it, even if it is there, you know, compared to all the other negatives that you get without estrogen. Thank you for sharing that. On on the first version of Sex After 70, Dr. Harris talked about hormone replacement therapy. And you must see it for pelvic floor therapy. If a woman comes in and she has no at least topical estrogen, the vaginal wall is, you know, thin and irritated and they have a lot of UTIs. It's really not a not a nice way to be if you don't have to be. Absolutely. We were just having a conversation with a urogynecologist earlier for patients with prolapse and how they require that the patients be using some kind of topical estrogen before even trialing any kind of pessary. But I'm going to shift back to men's health. And I wanted to talk about uh, for men who have had prostate removal, prostate cancer, how that might impact their sexual function and how you go about in treating that. Right. So when men have had either radiation or a radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer, it definitely affects their erections, the vast majority of them. And many of them do not get and maintain good erections afterwards. Why that is, is not 100% clear that most of the feeling is that it's mostly neurologic because the nerves, they try to do nerve sparing radical prostatectomies, but a very high percentage of men after that procedure do have erection issues. So basically, after a radical prostatectomy, I always feel like men should be on a daily Cialis, which is long acting to try to bring more blood there. And we try to get them so to speak, up and running as soon as possible after the procedure. In general, if it is just a jig problem, they should respond very well to the injections I was speaking about, because basically that's going directly you know, to the nerve, the ends of the nerves. A lot of men will get and maintain very good erections with those injections. Now, if they end up having the nerves heal and doing well, then they can stop the injections. But in the meantime, they've sort of helped rehab the penis. They've had a dynamic sex life, you know, 
in the post-operative period, and they probably made it more likely that they were going to regain some of their potency. So I believe in very aggressive, immediate treatment of their erection issues, not just waiting around for two years, hoping that comes back. Pelvic floor physical therapy, we see the changes also in the muscle function post these procedures. So we've worked a lot with the patients in trying to regain better control of muscular function for sexual function, but also for urinary and, and for urinary incontinence. Well. Yeah, no, I think the pelvic floor stuff is real. Right, we we don't deal with that as much, but it yeah. would make sense that pelvic floor therapy would be really important for main, you know getting back your continence. How else can we influence the change in the stigma for sex after 70? Because I know that many of the patients who come into our office, they come in and they're like, no one's really talking to us about sex right. anymore. Again, we're talking about the men. I think men are having more and more and appropriately higher expectations of their functioning for their whole life. One yeah. of my favorite stories is that I had a guy come in who was 85 for erection issues. And we started his evaluation. And then he came in the next visit very pleased. And he said, by the way, Dr. Werner, I lied to you. And I said, well, what did you lie about? And why did you lie? And he said, well, I'm actually 95, but I was afraid you wouldn't treat me. Oh, now, I wow. told you I was 85. And I, was, I would have treated you if you were 105. So he did very nicely. What's interesting is, I guess I have a very sophisticated group of men usually coming. So they're demanding, like they're like, I'm a healthy 74. 70 is the new 50. They're expecting that we're going to manage every aspect of their sexual health. They're like sometimes surprised that they're not functioning like when they were 20. You are 75. 70% of men at 70 have erection issues. We can manage them, but when you're 40, you're going to need, you know, reading glasses. At a certain right. point, you might need a knee replaced. You are not the bionic man. You know, so their expectations actually sometimes are unrealistically, almost humorously high. And we can always get them erections. That's the nice thing. Where we're running again into the problems, we have, we definitely have tools to help them uh, reach, you know, ejaculation from intercourse. But mm -hmm. I can't look them in the eye and say for sure I'm going to be able to help you with that and guarantee it. But we do have a bunch of, that's sort of the new frontier of sexual medicine, and we are getting better at it, but we don't have those guarantees that we have with everything else. Got it. So I think we had a very thorough conversation now, but I wanted to wrap up and ask if you have any final remarks before we close up this conversation. No, thank you for having me. I think, again, the interface between uh, pelvic floor therapists and urologists who specialize, and especially in ED, is men should just be aware if they have that grouping of symptoms, which lead you to think you have chronic pelvic pain syndrome, which would be weird pain, peeing issues erection issues and bowel issues, assume that you have chronic pelvic pain syndrome. If someone says you have chronic prostatitis, run. Don't take lots of antibiotics. See someone like me and someone like you and embark on a course of pelvic floor therapy, daily Cialis, an anti-anxiety medicine. And the other thing that we use, by the way, sort of number four is Valium suppositories, actually, into the rectum. And that can help relax those muscles. And I bet you use those as well in certain contexts. We work very closely with the pelvic floor therapists, and obviously, as in any field, some of them are better than others, and we really try to find the ones that are really willing to work with the men, you know, both in an aggressive but non-threatening way. And it's one of those very many examples where the different professional groups work hand in hand. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Werner, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your knowledge. And thank you everyone for tuning in to listen. Spread the word about these options and specialty for treatments for sexual dysfunction for men. Join me next time for another informational conversation. Thank you.